bonus footage, folks. We've got the helicopter up and we'll stick with it as long as we can. We'll lay out and let you enjoy the pictures as well. Right at the front there, is that a sail tie on the, on the bow there flapping around? Why do they have that there? That would be a sail tie when they, um, when they go for a jib change, then often they'll strap the head of the jib down to the deck just to keep it really low profile, not in the water, all tidy and clean. Um, or if they go for, uh, if they need to change a halyard out, then they'll use those sail ties just to protect. Good audio as well. Are you kidding? Oh well, maybe, <laughs> maybe I spoke too soon. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, look at that. Hauling the mail. Amazing. 30 knots of boat speed, and it's blowing 25 to 28 right now, and the call is for the breeze to increase all the way through the night up to about 30 knots, and the seas are going to be a bit of an issue. They were talking about it being quite steep chop up to 3.5 or even 4-metre waves. What sort of pressure does that put on the boats? Yeah, so they just have to control the bouncing around, really. Um, but at this angle, you can just kind of drive through the waves, and sort of your goal is to accelerate over the top of them there. You see the bow coming flying up out of the water and then crashing down on the backside. Um, you're just trying to manage that and not not really, you know, bounce around too hard, no real smacking on the bow, but just trying to surf it through. Oh, big waves from the main trimmer there. <laughs> How great is that? They are loving life. <laughs> then the big wave comes right over the boat and this is what they're going to be dealing with for certainly the next four days look at that beautiful this is Matt Frey oh. just slicing through the waves bit of surfing bit of flying huh? look at that they're triple bagged they've got three sails up at the front more than the Dong Fong had yeah Interesting. So, so what's that? That's the Masthead Zero, the two, the J2 and the J3. That's there. correct, yep. J2, J3. I think one thing they've learned even in the last, towards the end of the last race, was that you there's enough space there for all three of those sails. We talk about the slot of the wind traveling between there and the main sail, adding more power, more stability, and um, a bit more sail area. Well, props to the helicopter pilot and the cameraman, Matt Connor, up there. He is a pro. If ever you see this sort of sailing footage you can imagine it's Matt Connor or his mate Adam who are doing the pictures they're amazing let's watch Blair Chuk in the middle there he's just looks like he's tidying up he won a gold and silver medal a silver in London and a gold in Rio and then he won the America's Cup can he win the coveted and yet to be won in sailing history, triple crown, as well as the winning the Volvo Ocean Race? And the only other person who has a shot at that is Peter Burling, who's on board Team Brunel, and it really is quite possible for Blair Chute to do it. Look at that. He's used to sailing, foiling catamarans on closed courses, and he is getting a real education out there of what ocean sailing is all about. Good techniques there, tidying up the halyards. Nice and clean, laying it over the top, and um, they'll they'll tidy every line on the boat and pack it away so that the first the water just doesn't drag it right off the stern, you don't lose it, but also um, if anything goes wrong, you have to be really ready to furl, drop, or rehoist the sail, and that's just all the preparation into having a, a nice clean boat. No one down below yet. We won't start the watch system for a while, Sally. When does that usually happen? When did it happen on SCA after you left on these legs? Um, it depends. You know, once you once you make that final turning mark and the stack is sorted, the ballast is sorted, the trim is sorted. It takes a little while for, for everybody to settle down. Um, right here, this is the best place for all the weight on the boat. So if if nobody's tired, I mean, it's still only three in the afternoon, so nobody needs a nap yet. Um, They'll just stack on that back rail, try to really press through this fleet. You know, Matt Free had a little bit to gain here, so they'll hang out. So it's not board. Wow. Yeah. Now. Well, if you're sitting at home quietly and comfortably on your couch or sofa watching this, imagine what these teams, these men and women are about to go through. As Pete 
<laughs> the pressure on the rig. Yeah. Pressure on the rig, pressure on the just everything. The guy on the bow there trying to sort the sheets over the boards. Oh. Tidying up, you said. Very important to get the boat all set. You Dutch four-time winners of the Volvo Ocean Race in its history since the start in 1973. Uh, Langford, and then we'll go to that, behind the he's, won, he's won the America's Cup with Team USA. Sally, just talk to us about we're seeing these waves crashing over the boat. I mean, it's, it's relentless. This is going to be going on for four whole days. Not a moment of rest in this breeze, pushing the boats to their absolute limit. Just give us an insight into how intense that is. It's super intense. I mean, the whole. Sailing <laughs> lesson. Just gives you an idea how uh, I can't even hear what the conversation is on board the boat, let alone when we've got the mics up. Seven, uh, uh, two microphones, seven cameras on board these boats are going to bring the action to you live and direct over the next three weeks. Here we go on board. Any lush right there? From the chopper. Yeah, okay. I think it's Maciel Cicchetti just giving that little uh, very frank summary of what he wanted to happen next. Yeah. What a cool way to see the dynamic of the boat, listening to the comms and seeing how much they have to sort out. All these different sheets. They're putting a safety sheet on the on the fro there in case something goes wrong. Releading it, having the jockey pull out to make sure it has the right angle and tidying up everything else on the bow. So we're calling that the outrigger now. Oh, sorry, the That's outrigger. That's right. The, the, the jockey pole is something that you whip a horse with, we reckon. So it's <laughs> an enough. outrigger that pushes that uh, lead of the sail just to leeward. Amazing. Stunning, stunning pictures. A real treat for us, and this is a little bonus extra from the helicopter. And the helicopter is getting very far away, so they are Bow cam on Brunel. Are you kidding? Awesome. Let's <laughs> see if we can uh, scroll through some of the onboard cameras just to give you an insight into some of the positions that we're going to be recording from. In Marsat, do a great job. There we go. Streaming live off the In Marsat. Sailor Satcom. When you next have problems with your Wi-Fi, appreciate this. It's going all the way up to a satellite streaming from the bow of Team Brunel. Fantastic technology. What a what a time to be alive. <laughs> Live shots from Dong Fong. So fast. What a treat. Oh. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Wish you were out there, huh? Right. Thanks, Thomas. Wow, 30 knots. I can tell you that is 30 knots and more. And the breeze is from the north. And so the weight of the breeze, they say, is uh, just that more. Sally, what's that all about? Yeah, sometimes when the breeze comes from the north, it's uh, like a colder, stronger breeze and um, heavier. So it has like a, more of a punch to it. If it's a warmer temp, you know, generally from the south, a lighter, softer breeze, then, you know, it doesn't feel as, as powerful. But today we have some 
strong, strong wind for them to uh, blast away in. Sung Hung Kai Scallywag. I think we're getting towards the end of the range of the helicopter as it follows the boats out. Just enjoy these pictures. Oh, could you hand up a dry towel, please? <laughs> what amazing shots. Both boards up. Yeah. That's because they're going down, basically downwind, right? Yep, basically downwind. Don't need the traction of the boards, don't need the drag. I can see Sally has just started to uh, play with her worry beads a little bit. How does it feel, Sally? Just oh. come on. <laughs> Getting a little jealous sitting here in this chair. But, uh, you know, these guys are just, this is what every single sailor out there is living for. Just ripping along, and once you get a chance to get on the helm, it's just like, uh, yeah, you just kind of get set free. It's like a sort of skateboard, downhill skateboard on the ocean. Yeah, so much fun. So much feel in these boats. Really, you get to drive it around over and on top and through the waves, and just trying to control the bow there, making sure it doesn't go too high or too d too low, diving into the into the backside of the wave. And, um, responsive, the responsive boats to drive. Really responsive boats to drive, and um, you know all all apparent wind sailing. So what that means is the the faster you go, the more you trim the sails on, and the faster you can keep going, which is amazing. Big old stack there. So that was that, all the jibs there, and then now they're stacking the spinnakers on top of the jibs. They'll be heavy. With They'll all be that heavy, water. yep. Really heavy. Take a few people to move each of those sails, but you can see how they didn't get it quite all the way to the back of the boat, and um, that's that's actually one of the techniques uh, of a good of a good team. Good teamwork is a is a real clean stack. You don't want it so high. You don't need a big high profile. You want it nice and tidy as far back as you can get it. Sometimes you turn the uh, turn the jib around because the the luff of the jib is a bit bigger than the than the leech and so uh, you take the effort to turn it around. Big old straps to strap everything in, you don't lose anything overboard. Quite important. You have to build those wheels nice and solid, right? Oh yeah. And they'll carry a spare wheel down below just in case somebody wipes out into it and you know, breaks it, it's all carbon. That happens when? Uh, generally, if, um, if the boat does wipe out, you know, a person might fall into it. If you get actually physically wiped off the wheel as some of these waves come crashing over the deck, um, and you hold on to the wheel, you might take it with you. So they're, they're strong and, and solid, but they're not bulletproof. Let's listen in. I think someone's doing, talking about doing the washing up in the galley. No. Actually, I think what that's on to me, just making sure everything is stacked in the back of the bus. Is every, you know, they probably had some fresh food, whatever they ate just before they started racing, left in the galley. Let's just make sure that it's all the way to the very back of the boat. They're really trying to get that bow up out of the water. I think we're really seeing the wave state increase here as they're ripping along. Time for a reef. Oh, submarine. Wow. It's like a fire hose when you're sitting there <laughs> taking all that on. Yeah. Get it live from Matt Connor up in the helicopter. He says, oh, this is a good bit. We've got him right here. We've got full main up. And they've got there. Very clear communication going on. Yeah. Say what you mean, mean what you say. <laughs> get the stack in the back of the bus so we can get this bow out of the water and stop taking these waves over our heads. <laughs> You can't sort of use too many words, fluffy conversations. You have to be absolutely crystal clear. Yeah, it's actually very loud on board right now with the waves crashing and everything. You kind of hear them using their like outside voices, right? Getting the message across. 
Well, for those of you who've just joined us, we've uh, got the helicopter back in the air, and this is sort of bonus footage, a real treat for us to be able to follow these boats as they head out and watch the breeze increase and the waves increase, and they're all tidying up, ready for sundown, which just comes in a couple of hours here off the coast of Portugal. Now they've got the masthead. That's, no, that's the fractional zero and the number two jib. It's slightly different from Matt Frey, which had the two and the three up, as well as the masthead zero. Just getting a little wobbly there, a little out of shape. Amazing. Well, as you'll appreciate, we are streaming from the helicopter, so every so often, here we go with the update of where all the teams are. Look at Manfred, they've got the hammer down, they are going fast, but Dong Fong leading over Manfred, over Team Brunel, then it's Sung Hung Kai Scallywag, Axo Nobel, and then turn the tide on plastic, and it looks like Vestas 11th hour racing, the winner of the previous leg, probably had to take down that masthead zero and change it to the fractional zero, and that's why they have lost out. We were talking about that in the show earlier. Jaco van der Horst, Formula One racing at sea. Well, I don't know how Formula One racing would uh, cope with this stuff. I'd like to see Lewis Hamilton try this. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's a legend though, four-time world champion in the Formula One, one of my favorite athletes. Here we go, Vestas, 11th hour racing. They've still got their masthead zero up and no reef. Very impressive. Very little distance between the boats right now. Don't worry too much about who's ahead and who's behind right now. Long way to go. Long way to go, and you know, the race ends in Cape Town, so this is just the beginning. They have a lot of miles, but also a lot of transition in, in breeze, so they're just kind of settling in, as you said, and, and finding their groove, not making too many big maneuvers. And important right now to stick with the pack, so it's, I would say that if Charlie was losing a lot, you know, they probably would have made the sail change, but I think it's good to see that they haven't made the sail change. They've made that choice. That's what they wanted out of, you know, on the legs out, and they kept with the masthead and are still ripping along down there. That's, that's the masthead zero, the two, the three, and an unreefed main. We cranked it up, boys and girls. That is cool pictures right there. And for sure, they that's kind of max sail area, and uh, we saw Map Free going through with the Fro and the J2 and the J3. Vestas is turning it up. Great paint job, all the paint uh, provided by Axo Nobel, who've uh, sponsored the boat yard and painted all of the boats in these beautiful colors. This is so cool. Anyway, just stick your comments in. There's Charlie Enright just surfing that boat downwind. Put your comments on Facebook. We'll try and answer your questions and get to you at some point. We've got a wonderful team of people here at Volvo Ocean Racing. All your comments are seen. This is the digital age, the social age. Oh, bow sprit burying in the water. Fans from all around the world, thanks for all of your support. And a, you need to set your alarm and make sure you get up for these live moments. There's Tony Mutter at the back. He's uh, looking like he's trying to sort out that snake's honeymoon, all those ropes all over the place, and he's tidying them up. Yeah, nice to see. They're putting on their life jackets, clipping in, getting doing. ready for the uh, the big sea state. You know, safety first here. This is um, this is big big waves and, and big uh, big pressure and big power and coming over the hull, coming over the top of the decks. So, Sally, on the scale of fresh to frightening, where are we right here? We're <laughs> probably in the middle. You see everybody's quite calm. But um, the fact that they got so much sail area up, they must feel super in control, taking a nice downwind angle. I think if the sea state increases any more, breeze picks up another couple of five, maybe not. So you'll see a, reef, a couple of reefs go in. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think back of the bus, clip on, and, uh, and let it rip, as they say. So you heard it from Sally Barkow. She sailed around the world on Team SCA last time. Great to have you here in the booth. It's wonderful to get your insight oh, oh. down the mine. You're starting to feel just that impact. I mean, that fire hose. You've had a few 
wave hits you so hard when you're driving, it like knocks the wind out of you, and that's when you know, okay, maybe we're maybe we need to do do something. So uh, when when in the middle of the night you're uh, lying in your bunk and you bury into a wave there doing 30 knots of boat speed, what, what's going on? Well, funny enough, we actually had some uh, seatbelts in our bunks, and uh, I was in the very aft top bunk, and you get tossed around, so you're always sleeping um, feet forward, make sure that you don't break your neck when that happens. But in the end, we um, we uh, installed some neoprene seat belts so that we could actually try to get some sleep. But when your body is just getting tossed around in a in a whirlpool or a, like you're in a tumble dryer, you're never really able to get any rest, and um, it's it's not easy. There's a lot of force down below. Every step you take, you're holding on, you're bracing yourself, and uh, you know you got to really look out for yourself. Injuries, nicks, cuts in the legs and hands, or anything like that, are just not good for the next 20 legs or and 20 it, days and it, it, it's hard to heal in, in, in constant wet let's listen on, let's listen on board best this level without racing well one of the things to point out here is all the crew are up on deck right now yeah the next you see thing that's going to happen is a reef yep that's oh, what's going to happen okay yeah. i was going to say uh, at some point they have to halve the amount of crew on deck and they've got to do the same thing half the people up there. Yeah, they do, they do. But they'll get this all sorted out. It's a bit like um, getting ready, as you were saying, for the night, you know, when you're getting your campsite all set and ready before it gets dark. That's what they're doing. They're making sure everything's right. And first thing here is to get the sail area sorted out. So you just sort of saw the bowman go to the mast there. He might have been checking the Cunningham and see, but generally when you see the bow go to the mast, they're, they're setting up for a reef. And um, I would say that's probably the right call for, for the masthead. Share your comments, those of you enjoying this oh, big puff. Share your comments, tell us where you're watching from, and you can ask any questions, follow along on all the social media channels. We've even got a game you can actually sail around the world in your own boat virtually from the comfort of your own living room. So when you're making a cup of tea, these guys and girls are trying to do it at a 30-degree angle steaming downwind at 30 knots, <laughs> can't imagine it. With a fire hose in your face, huh? Well, I was very lucky to sail one of these boats uh, this year in the Annapolis to Newport race. We broke the record. We had some incredible driving and got up to 25 knots off New York, and it was quite wonderful. I was I was right there getting the experience, and it was really good with the Wounded Warrior Sailing Project. Ralphie Stites, you know Ralphie, was sailing one of his boats. It was brilliant. Great guy. Here goes the reef. Putting a reef in. Discretion is the better part of valor. Nudging up one more to walk from fresh to frightening, but as Sally says, it's somewhere in between the two, so not quite there yet. What's yeah, I think what, when does it get to frightening? It gets frightening when you have to do a lot of jibes in this stuff, I think. Then you're then you're really worried about breaking things. Um, you know, right now it's kind of fresh and fun, a bit wild, maybe on the wild side. Uh, but yeah, it is really what you live for. This is really the uh, the reason why these sailors are out there, the reason why they call it the Volvo Ocean Race. Yeah, right. And the next mark, folks, is different from previous editions of this race. They had a waypoint off the coast of Brazil. No waypoints now. The next mark is the finishing line off Cape Town, 7,000 miles distant. 21 to 22 days the routing is calling for. Uh, life jackets on, great to see that, yep. uh, folks. Safety is no accident, and you can see it from the very best. Life jackets are essential. You let go of one of those, and they'll clip themselves on at some point, right? Let's yeah, I think that's Nick Dana there by the mast, and he's clipped on. He's just sorting out the Cunningham. They have to spike it to get the main out of the lock, then they drop it down into one reef, and then um, make sure the cuno is, is made, and then they'll put a lot of pressure on that Cunningham, flatten out the sail. And, uh, and then take up the outboard reef line, and that's also on a lock. So everything's quite safe once they're in that mode. But you can see they didn't they didn't really change angle or lose too much speed to put that reef in. So yeah. it's a quite a good setup. Um, they'll make sure everything's ready to go. And just tell us uh, uh, tell us what the Cunningham is. It's not a, a clever farm animal. <laughs> no, it's not. But that would be nice. It's just the, uh, a line that. Uh, pulls the sail down from the front there, which we call the luff, straight down, and that'll flatten the sail out and and um, keeping it really, really uh, secure to the rig. So we've got a question on Facebook. Uh, Sally, you will answer this. Uh, how do the tactics or the 
sort of onboard change when the light goes in these waves sailing at night? Sailing at night, um, you know, really it's key right now for these sailors all to get dialed into the wave state as they go before the sun sets. You'll get into a rhythm. At night, you can see what's right around you, so you can, um, you know, kind of see the white caps and all that. And then you're just you're feeling the boat. They're going to be uh, they're going to be in full moon tonight, so it's going to be actually pretty bright for them. Whoa, big bow up there. They're just leaping over these waves, so you can feel that on the helm. You kind of have to know what's your way out. You know, if you ever sailed a high performance boat before. It, you have to know which way is going to get you out of trouble. And right now, to bear away, that'll get them out of trouble. When they're in pitch black, that's the hardest thing. You have to have some numbers in your head, and you got to keep within a range of, uh, of numbers, compass bearing and, and apparent wind, and make sure you don't. When you're trying to bail out of a situation, you're not going too low into a jive, and you're just kind of maintaining a, a safe range of, of compass numbers. And the instruments are on the mast? Instruments are on the mast right there below the boom. If you see that American Danish flag, it's just forward of that and lower on the boom. There's um, five B&G instruments there. It has the heading, the uh, wind strength, the apparent wind angle, which is the, which has to do with the speed and how fast you're going through the water. And that, those are just the numbers. That all turns to red light at night, so your eyes can, you know, don't get too whacked out with the bright light. And um, that's how they drive in these big waves downwind. What stunning, stunning pictures. Here we go to the virtual eye. Looks like Bestus 11th Hour Racing have got the bit between their teeth now. These thoroughbred racehorses. Here we go from uh, Hero Lettinen. Sleepless night ahead. Sea legs still a bit numb. Bon voyage. <laughs> yeah. Well, these are true pros, and they'll be very conscious that they do need sleep, right? You can't can't do 22 days at sea and not have a routine no and it'll take like you know a day or two sometimes it takes you know people two or three days to actually settle into their offshore routine but because it was you know kind of a more of a straightforward leg start and now a ripping downwind I mean look at those shots that is oh. just that's an ocean that's a real ocean there right. <laughs> yeah but it'll take them a few days to settle in but once they do they'll be in the sleep rhythm and they'll actually be able to get some rest um, but they'll all be guns blazing here not not a stitch of dirt in that picture it is just ocean thanks Carl Dame amazing sailing best filming ever I've got to say this helicopter footage is stunning wow what a treat for us and we'd finished the broadcast about half an hour ago and our tech team came out of the gallery and said actually we're gonna recharge the helicopter how many knots well they're doing 22 to 25 knots of boat speed in uh, 30 knots building uh, of wind speed. Might even and be more, so they might be doing 30 knots there of boat speed. What's the latest, Sally's got it, yeah, 32, 34, 32.7 32. was the max in the last, uh, last 30 minutes. Let's turn the tide on plastic, being passed by a container ship, and I'm pretty sure Di Cafaro would be hoping that they didn't lose any of those containers overboard. It's one of the biggest dangers, right? Here's Valerie McMahon, talk a little about how the import races affect things the point system yeah so on all of the legs of the ocean legs you get uh, eight points for a win you get six points for second place so they basically give a bonus point for the win and that's to ensure that there's actually a premium for taking a little risk around the race course and winning the leg previous editions sometimes the, the the boats have sailed around sort of like sheep in a paddock all around close to each other so they've added a bonus point uh, for a bonus if you win the leg and then we've got three ocean legs across the Atlantic and two around the Southern Ocean and those are double points so you'll get seven times two and then you'll get the extra bonus points so you'll get 15 points for winning any of those three ocean legs get uh, 12 points for coming second, get 10 points for coming third, and so on down. The import races, you get uh, just standard points, seven through down to one, seven points for the winner. And those import races will accumulate for the import overall series, which comes with a trophy and much plaudits and admiration for fans and sailors alike. But it won't count towards the overall trophy unless there is a tie break after the ocean points. 
have all been accumulated. There's one other bonus point is the team that sails around the world fastest in accumulated time, so the shortest amount of time from start to finish in all 12 of the legs will be given an, also given an extra bonus point. I hope that's clear, but the three ocean legs are double points. You get seven points for a win, one point for seventh place, and then you get a bonus point for the win, so that gives you eight on a standard leg. And then for the three ocean legs, the two southern oceans, and then the Atlantic leg, you get double points. So if you win, you get seven times two, which is 14, plus one bonus point. Keep up, please. Get your pen shop and your pencils. There'll be a test later. <laughs> you lost me halfway through that, but I think we got it. I think we're on to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I could have done that more simply, but anyway, uh, uh, go on the Volvo Ocean Race website. You can follow along. Look at these waves. Yeah. Wow. Di Kafari and her turn of the tide on plastic team. They had a great stop over here in Lisbon, sort of their home stopover, sponsored by the Mirpuri Foundation, the United Nations. They've got a great message about getting rid of single plastic use water bottles. We've got our reusable water bottles right here in front of us in the studio. And plastic, single use plastic water bottles are the scourge of the ocean. They reckon there's gonna be more plastic in the ocean uh, by 2030 than there will be fish in the ocean. And I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want a dinner of, um, of, um, of, of fried plastic. Yum. Plastic and chips, oh. sounds real bad. Yeah, look at, at the back of the boat. They've got some of those newbies on board. They'll be pretty wide-eyed right now, Sally. I mean, they are professional sailors, let's face it, but still, this is a real blooding of the uh, of the crew here. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's this is going to be a wide-eye open experience for them. Um, and to be honest, they're looking, the boat looks kind of loose, you know? It looks kind of jumping around the waves. Something that happens here with uh, apparent wind sailing is that if you sail around with the sails too eased, your your the power of the boat is really unbalanced, so you're really on and off, and um, I kind of fear that's what's what's going on right here at the moment, where um, sails are all a bit eased out, and because they're trying to bleed the power, but then the boat slows down, and they have to head up and gain power again. So they're just going to take a little bit for uh, the the newbies, as we say, or a little less experienced sailors to um, to dial the boat in and just lock it in so that it can calm down and just be leaping over these waves. You really want to see it leaping instead of surging. Oh, oh that's massive. <laughs> and uh, are there, what, what happens when all the water goes down below? You have pumps on board, Sally? Um, pumps are human muscle pumps. <laughs> There's really? uh, yeah, you just go for the bucket and start bailing out. Everything is fairly, as we say, watertight on deck there. Um, with uh, you know seals around all of everything that goes down below, but you know for sure there'll be they'll be bailing buckets every every watch change. Um, generally, if you go down below, you're you know get a few buckets out for sure in the bow, making sure that you don't want any weight in the bow. There, as you can see, you want it just to be surfing above the waves and not digging down. Uh, but it's a pretty dangerous place to go down below in the bow. You can really get just thrown from one side to the other. Awesome slower right there yeah, as they get into the trough see, of the wave. You see that surge, we need to really just lock it in. That's what they'll be trying to do. Trimming on that front sail a little bit more so they can be leaping over the waves like we were seeing uh, at Free and, and the, the, Bestis. the new partner, Sky Ocean Rescue, that's part of the uh, Sky Television Broadcast uh, mission to try and rid the ocean of plastic. Got all sorts of initiatives all around the world to try and help do that. There is a real massive surge, and the Volvo Ocean Race is really committed to getting rid of single use plastic. The ocean is a playground for these sailors, guys, and girls. And they've seen it over the last few editions of the incredible increase in plastic in the ocean. And we ask everybody to take the pledge just something little, anything you like, but get your own reusable water bottle and try and fill it up. You'll start to get used to it, and when you go to a place that has the ability to um, give you clean water, you can just go and fill it up and uh, put it in your backpack, and it really helps. Every little helps, any kind of pledge. And once you really start looking at it, you'll be amazed. Oh, wow. You'll be amazed at how much plastic you actually use unnecessarily. We need to turn the tide on plastic. I reckon the sea state's getting large out there. 
Wow. It's sketchy. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting big. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this, uh, that's how the mast falls down. You bow, bow into one of those waves. Yeah. Pretty safe. Yep, pretty safe at the moment. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you basically, the mast falls down when you push it too hard or load it up too hard or, yeah, I can't stop believe I and start too quickly. I can't believe I even said that. You shouldn't have. I'm no, pretty sure you are not talking about have. stuff like that. All good. D. Kafari, yeah, the runners there on the right-hand side, they're all huddled around the runners. Everyone looks like having a nice time, though. Look at that Henry Bombry just sharing a little uh, little joke. D. Kafari looking a little more focused, I'd say. <laughs> She's got her duck head on. She's uh, taking the waves. They're all strapped in. Bianca nice and Cook safe. and Francesca Clapchi. Clapchi, yeah, you, you butchered that one at the... Uh... Oh, I did. I did a terrible <laughs> job at the... <laughs> How do you say it? Clapchich. Clapchich. Yeah, I completely butchered it on the dock out show. I have to pronounce all of these names all quite correctly, otherwise I upset everyone. But I managed to get an apology before she left. Great girl, she's wonderful. What a what a good uh, what a good sense of humor she had, particularly at my uselessness. <laughs> yeah, I think she might get that often, but she's yeah, started laser laser radial expert into the uh, 49er FX and there she is trimming the main, you know, calling the shots, how much power the boat needs. Really performance sailor, and uh, Dee's, Dee's pretty happy to have her on boat. 19, 20, surging up to 25 knots sometimes for these guys down the waves. I hope Matt Connors has eyes on the old fuel gauge on the helicopter, but we are loving it right now. This, for any folks who've just joined us, a little bonus footage. We recharged the credit card, stuck the helicopter up in the air, and we are getting some awesome, awesome pictures. Stunning. know the cameraman pretty well Matt Connor he will be loving this this is his absolute bread and butter his life was made for being able to take pictures like this you won't see the likes of this any uh, 20 miles offshore the fleet are and they are leaving in a hurry 22 to 25 knots of boat speed shot out of a cannon from Lisbon amazing has been famous for its adventurers, and these adventurers are taking it on, grabbing it by the neck, and shaking these boats downwind. What a shakedown. What a shakedown. Looks like they're starting to lock it in a little bit better here, which is really nice. Put a reef in. Yep. Okay, turn the tide of plastic. We'll just go to the virtual eye. Thanks to our virtual eye team who are in the gallery and just. Uh, appraised of exactly what's going on. That's the front of the fleet, Dongfong race team, and then Brunel, Matt Frey. Do they have AIS on from John Piraboom? Yes, they do. They have to have AIS on all the time so that container ships and traffic around the ocean know where they are. And the AIS uh, goes about six miles, is it, Sally? What, how far do you, can you see under AIS? Yeah, six to ten, depending on the, uh, the visibility and so once you get outside of six or six, six to ten miles away from the other boat, you stop to stop seeing them under AIS. And that's when it sort of goes a little dark and you're just hoping that you're going in the right direction and you're going faster than your competitors. Must be nervous moments. Really nervous when you're used to, you know, gauging yourselves against somebody else, angle, speed. You can really gauge what sails they're on and, uh, you know, when you're out there on your own, you're sort of at a guessing game and you're getting a sked every six hours it is, right, for them. So checking in, much rather stay with the fleet when you ever have a choice. Helicopter's got the hammer down, just going back towards our final boat in the fleet. I think this is Axo Nobel. Okay. Ingeborg Nielsen, amazing picture, sail strong. Well, thanks very much. We've, uh, in the dock out show, we the blessing of the fleet and we made sure we let everyone know that our thoughts are with them to sail safe. Joseph, 420 dinghy sailor. I call this amazing, but we do too. It's a real treat for us. Axo Nobel coming into shot from the helicopter. That's Lisbon way out there and Cascais and the amazing tourist area of Sintra, which I highly recommend. Brandon Flack. Andy, who's the youngest sailor in the fleet? Come on. Uh, it is uh, 
Scallywag. On Scallywag, Tom, uh, uh, Tom. Ben Pickett, thank you. Ben Pickett, the youngest sailor on board. And now you're gonna ask me what his name is. Brandon Flack from Connecticut there, phoning in, I do know him. And he's just trying to stitch me up <laughs> with the most detailed question he could find. I think Ben is just 20, 23, 20. All right. Maybe 21, 21, 23. I'll get back to you on that. We'll, uh, I'll go back to my researchers. I do have it in this huge stack of papers chaotically strewn around now. We got called back into the booth. Uh, and I'll, uh, we, I'll, this is when I need Niall Myers. He'd, he'd know, he'd <laughs> he'd know to the it. day. <laughs> and uh, remember, you can follow. We are doing live updates from Alicante headquarters all through the race. There goes the reef in, and that looks like Brad Ferrand there just getting the Cunningham in and safely getting the mainsail reefed, all of the life jackets on board. Nikolai Sestead driving with Simeon Teampont just next to him, and they're getting all their helmsmen and women accustomed, getting them a sort of bit of wheel time before it goes dark, right? Yeah, that'll be the goal. I think they'll, they probably have a watch change before it gets dark here, um, getting everybody sort of dialed into the conditions so that you can end up sailing with, you know, three, four, or five on deck. Probably, there'll probably be five on deck through the night just in case they need to drop a reef in quickly if the breeze builds a second reef. That would be, you know, if it builds over 35 knots, which I don't think it's forecast to, but you just want to be ready for that. Yeah, forecast is for maximum 30 five or so okay. so yeah it's quite different setups on all the boats sally here just talk to us about this one right here looks like a j3 the fro and a reef in the main there but yeah i think you can see big differences in the trim here which is uh i think this is this live footage is really cool to see just because of that but you see the fractional just quite eased out and, and free in the main a bit tighter and the j3 a bit tighter where on the uh, turn the tide you saw the main quite loose the J3 quite tight and the fro quite loose and kind of all over the place. These guys are a bit more locked in, but you know, as soon as you can take the power on the front, we say, so as soon as you could trim on the fro and keep the boat under control, you would, you know, make sure that you can, because they are kind of blasting off on this downwind reach. You know, you want to take the power and, and run down with it. Amazing, let's just look at this. Pigot's 21. Australian, great job. He's on some Hakai Scallywag. Thanks for the tough question, Brandon Flack. I have to filter these a little more. <laughs> 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 Whoa, look at that. Big wave down the mine. And just talk to us about the different setup because we saw Matt Frey with what they call triple bagging, three yep. sails up at the front. Yep, that's well, and when we saw that, you could see that there was space there, and you can actually see it now. There, there's space in between the two front sails to add another one. Um, it, it can do two things. It can create, well, it creates more power, right? And it also can create a little more lift on the bow, which can help to um, pull the bow up out of the water. And there's space because there's space in the slot. Do you need it in this condition? Is it a truly tested situation? You know, pretty hard to say. We are working with one design boats, but they did change a few things on these boats. I think a couple pairs of them had done some two sail or had done some testing with each other, but it's um, it's all about their targets right now and their boat speed targets and what they're comfortable with, really. And they match that with the wave state and if they actually need another sail. Right now, to put up a third sail would be quite a big loss because you need one or you know two maybe people on the bow to plug it in as you say put the tack on put the halyard on then you have to hoist it you have to run the sheets back and you don't need anybody forward of the rig right now it's just quite it actually is a very dangerous place and you have to slow the boat down a little bit to make sure you don't wipe anybody off the bow yeah Chris Nicholson stuck in there somewhere. We've just got a question in from Peter Montgomery from New Zealand. Are you having fun yet, Andy? <laughs> yes, PJ, I'm having a right old time. Peter the true Montgomery, voice of sailing, uh. now uh, just retired from most of his uh, rugby and sailing commentary, but the most famous sailing commentator around, amazing sure. guy. And uh, 
Leon Sefton and all of his Kiwi friends here in the gallery give you a big shout out. PJ Montgomery, a veteran of uh, Volvo Ocean Race commentary. Lovely to have you watching these beautiful pictures of Axo Nobel. Chris Nicholson on board there. That is their new appointee, along with Peter Van Newkirk and Jules Salter back in the mix as their navigator. All Grip, one of the brands of Axo Nobel. And they have actually something called All Wood as well, which is an excellent covering for wooden boats. And I've just used it on my wooden floors. I can highly recommend it. It's amazing. It's soft and elastic -y. Real good. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Maybe I'll get two free cans. Okay. Well, the uh, helicopter has reached its 25 mile limit and uh, out of fuel. We will look at Dongfong Race Team, Matt Frey, Team Brunel, Sung Hun Kai Scalliwag, Vestas, 11th Hour Racing, Turn the Tide on Plastic, Axo Nobel. This leg, 7,000 miles from Lisbon to Cape Town. This is where. Dreams are made, legends are made, and sometimes shattered and broken. We are going to follow this race for the next three weeks. Don't miss a beat. All of it on social media. You can find it all on the VolvoOceanRace.com website. And we look forward to hearing of all of your questions, comments, and enjoy the ride. What a special treat for these amazing pictures out of Lisbon. Thanks, everyone, for watching. It's been real fun.